I think this is one of the most important issues of our time. And uh, if you want more detail about this, and, and, and in fact, I would encourage you to, to, to learn as much as you can about it, go over to lasthours.org, lasthours.org, and you can watch the entire video. And there's a free downloadable PDF of, our, of the book that this is based on, as well as you know, Kindle and Nook versions and stuff like that, and information about it, and also uh, ways that you can sign the, the petition that uh, I think Tick, Tick, Tick is the organization, which is a coalition of about 400 environmental groups, is putting together to take to the uh, COP meeting in, in Paris in 2015 to demand change on global climate change. So, you know, check it out, lasthours.org. We're rolling this thing out today. The, the, the video was produced by George DiCaprio and Earl Katz and Matthew Schmidt and uh, d directed by, by Lila Connors, and uh, I narrated it. And here's the rest of it. You warm the environment, that causes the release of more carbon which is either methane or carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That in turn increases the rate of warming, which releases even more carbon. And you can see how this begins to cause a so-called positive feedback or just uh, a, an ever increasing amount of heating. At the end of 2012, the World Bank issued a report warning governments around the world that a five degree temperature increase is likely unless drastic action is taken to curb carbon emissions. And a six degree increase was, according to some scientists, all it took to pass a tipping point during the Permian mass extinction. There's a virtual scientific consensus that six degrees was all it took to initiate the PETM. In both cases, it involved massive releases of methane. We know that in the bottom of the seafloor, uh, large parts of the ocean margins have, have methane in a solid phase. And what happens is, is that uh, uh, when you change the temperature, it, it can dissociate, or you can think of it as melting this, this uh, frozen methane phase. And so the idea is that during some of these events, we have some triggering uh, or initial cause that forces the uh, ocean temperatures to warm, especially in deep parts of the ocean. And then that dissociates or melts this, this solid methane phase, which then goes into gas, which can get into the ocean and the atmosphere. Methane is way worse than carbon dioxide. It's inert right now in the soil. It's not affecting anybody in any way. When you warm it, it becomes a gas. Then it starts acting immediately as a greenhouse gas. So this is an immediate and very short-term threat to planetary civilization. The risk is a so-called runaway greenhouse, which is that the self-correcting mechanism cease to kick in. Um, and you heat by a little bit and you release methane. That then causes excess heating. Uh, and you release more methane, and so it goes on. That's the, the probably the biggest issue that we face. Um, sea level change is a big one, too, a very expensive one to manage, but the methane release from the tundra, it, it, once that gets underway, we reach a point where uh, we lose the option of, of having an effective mitigation strategy. Um, we can always abandon the coastlines, but if if we activate enough of the carbon reservoir in, in the terrestrial um, biosphere, the, that becomes unmanageable. So that, that's an, unfortunately kind of a doomsday scenario that our trajectory is pointed to. Most disconcerting, the Arctic ice sheet that keeps the carbon stable is melting rapidly. In July 2013, the Arctic lost 41,000 square miles, an area half the size of Kansas, every single day. And scientists have witnessed kilometer-wide columns of methane gas bubbling up from the ocean floor, suggesting the tipping point to runaway climate change is dangerously close. While it appears we've already passed the tipping point for an ice-free Arctic in the summer, other tipping points could be centuries, generations, or just years down the road. The big danger about tipping points is that you can only recognize them when it's too late to do anything about it. So why should we risk these catastrophic events? In the case of climate change, our planet's life support system is at stake. So it is our obligation to take 
every precaution to stop it. We must begin to reduce carbon emissions dramatically. Yet, at this moment, we're facing a crisis of world leadership. Powerful fossil fuel corporations are fighting to monetize the trillions of tons of carbon they own that's still underground. The world community, global citizens, governments, leaders, NGOs, and corporations must come together, step forward, and take decisive action. Let's continue the research, but let's not wait until we pass more tipping points. This is the most urgent of times and a most urgent message. Please forward this to as many people as you can. I really want to get the word out on this. The thing that really woke me up to this issue was, you know, back in the 1990s, and this is the, the, the science of extinctions is so recent. In fact, let me, let me go back a little farther beyond that. Back in the 1960s, there was no scientific consensus, or in the 1950s, there was no scientific consensus about what caused the KT extinction, the, the, the extinction that killed off the dinosaurs. And nobody had any idea what caused the Permian mass extinction. Of the five, five times extinctions have happened in the history of planet Earth. Five times. In each case... Those extinctions, and by the way, a mass extinction in scientific parlance is defined as a time when more than 50% of all species on Earth vanish. More than half of all life dies. The Permian, 95% of all life died. The fossil record from the Permian, from, you know, a, there's a, about an 80,000 year period in the Permian where the fossil record is nothing but dead mud. In each case, these five mass extinctions that the Earth has experienced in the past billion or so years since life really emerged on this planet, it's been the result of carbon coming into the atmosphere in such high quantities that it warms the planet beyond the ability of the life forms that are then on the planet to deal with it, to survive. It kills pretty much everything off, and then life reboots itself. Think of it this way. The, you know, we, uh, James Lovelock talked about the Gaia hypothesis, you know, Earth is a living thing. Well, sort of. The planet is arguably not a living thing. The planet is a ball of molten metal and rock hurtling through space at, at tens of thousands of miles per second that has a very thin crust around its outer surface that has cooled enough and a very thin layer of atmosphere over that, it's only five miles high from the, very, from, from the Earth to the top. I mean, you, you can bicycle this in, in 15 minutes, the distance from here to the top of the atmosphere. You could walk it in an hour if you could walk up. So you've got this very thin crust on the Earth and this very thin atmosphere surrounding this giant ball of molten rock. And what has happened five times in the deep geologic past is that the Earth has cracked open and released enormous quantities of carbon-based, typically, although usually there's also others, uh, the fluorines and sulfurs and, and, and uh, chlorines, but principally carbon-based gases, mostly carbon dioxide. And that has warmed the planet to the point where these pools of methane, which are the result of the decomposition of plant matter, dead plant matter, and they, they, they die and they settle to the bottom of the ocean, they rot, and as they rot, they produce gas. But if they do it at, at a temperature below 30, 32, degrees Celsius, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius, that methane gas, instead of bubbling up from the ocean, instead becomes trapped in ice lattices and forms this kind of slurry, snow cone-like slurry called methane clathrate or methane hydrate. And there's somewhere between 4 and 10 billion tons of this stuff under the oceans. So in each one of the five previous extinctions, the Earth's core, the Earth's 
skin was punctured. In the case of the one that killed off the dinosaurs, it was punctured by a volcano. In the case of the Permian, it turns out we now know it was punctured by tectonic activity. One giant continent tearing itself in two in an area now called the Siberian Traps and this huge release of lava over thousands of years and all the carbon dioxide that came out with that lava. Enough of that carbon dioxide came into the atmosphere that it warmed the planet somewhere between 6 and 20 degrees, which hit the tipping point where the methane in the oceans began to melt and gas out into the atmosphere. That doubled the rate of global warming, because methane is about 100 times more potent as a, as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It doesn't last as long. It lasts about 20 years. But it, it, you know, that doubled the rate of global warming, and that killed off virtually, well, in the case of the Permian, 95% of all life on Earth. So here's where it comes around to us. The previous fa past five times, the Earth's surface was cracked by natural things. Volcanoes, tectonic activity, meteorite. This time, over the last 150 years, we're doing it with drilling and mining and fracking. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. And so here's the problem. If, our, if we produce enough carbon dioxide to warm that methane, we're in a big world of trouble.